Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce the next panelist, uh, Charlotte Billy Pandlin from Concordia University, Montreal. Her paper is titled Fan Fiction, Fan Photoethnography, and Everyday Life. Thank you. So I thought I'd uh, just start by giving a brief background to contextualize my presentation. I'm currently undertaking my doctoral research in the Interdisciplinary Humanities program, and I'm working on English Communication Studies and Sociology. While my research focuses on celebrity discourses, today I'll be talking about fandom and its connection to everyday life. The problem remains, how do we speak about the everyday? How can we discuss everyday life in all its ambiguities and complexities, with all its polyvocal rhythms, when the moment the words fall from our mouths, the illusion evaporates and suddenly it vanishes. Thus, we are looking at the everyday in hindsight, in mere representations that fail to take into account the embodied smells, sights, and feelings of lived action. I wake up, brush my teeth, listen to the radio, drink coffee, and continue moving through the routines of my day until, jolted out of my routine, someone asks what I did over the weekend. What did I do? My thoughts race back and I give an account of my past actions forming a representation of my weekend appropriate to the context, i.e. a cafe, a graduate seminar, a job interview. Another problem arises. I always need more than I can say in just so many words. I let it go and fall back into my routine. These questions are not new, and many scholars have contemplated them before. While Henri Lefebvre searches for the everyday within the realms of leisure, work, and home, for Maurice Blanchot, the everyday simply escapes it cannot be, be pinned down. It cannot be defined. Rita Felsky reflects this hatefulness of the everyday when she states, at first glance, everyday life seems to be everywhere, yet nowhere. <coughs> because it has no clear boundaries, it is difficult to define. Harold Garfinkel attempts to bring these invisible aspects of the everyday to the forefront, seeking to understand how people make sense of their everyday lives. While Roger Silverstone investigates everyday life as a moral and social space, Mike Featherstone understands the everyday as a process. Further, Stephen Crook explores the minotaur of the everyday, a mythology that seeks to preserve its community. <clears throat> Yet the questions persist. If the everyday remains elusive, has no clear boundaries, escapes, is somewhere and nowhere, and disappears upon closer inspection, then how can we talk about the everyday? Belsky reminds us that when the everyday is subject to critical scrutiny, it ceases to be everyday. Correspondingly, Ben Heimor asks, how can we pay attention to non-events without simply turning them into events? Moreover, how can we accurately represent the everyday given its embodied sensations and all its subtle intricacies? How can I describe the smells, sights, and textures of lived action? The re reiteration of these questions establishes the rhythm of the literature on everyday life. In this article, Homework, Routine, Social Aesthetics, and the Ambiguity of Everyday Life, Heimer offers a potential solution to these problems. In order to gain a sense of the experiential facets of routine, he advocates a return to Simmel's idea of sociological aesthetics and investigates the possibility of a socio-aesthetic form and approach to the everyday. For Heimer, focusing on aesthetics means privileging representations, forms, and patterns of experience that foreground experiences that frequently go undetected. This includes scouring artworks to find these expressive forms. In contrast to the perspective that, that to call something art is to remove it from the pragmatic demands and, and needs of the quotation, he contends that artwork should be treated as a form of social and cultural research, particularly suited to the description of experience. At the same time, Heimor fears that structures of routine, which permeate the everyday, might not produce aesthetic forms, and consequently sets out in search of a socio-aesthetic approach to routine, advocating two potential models. He regards Lucy Girard's study of cooking as an exemplar of socio-aesthetic research practices, with her use of polyvocal montage as an aesthetic form that translates the complexity and ambiguity of the everyday. Further, he proposes Lefebvre's rhythm analysis as a socio-aesthetic approach, as it suggests forms for grasping the experiential uh, actuality of the everyday in all its complexity, by acknowledging the multiple overlapping rhythms of everyday life. To this end, I want to suggest another socio-aesthetic form and approach to the everyday, fan fiction. In this paper, I understand fan fiction as textual, te uh, textual expressions of the everyday lives of fans in which they draw on familiar characters, 
and stories of popular culture to work through the emotions and frustrations of everyday life. And I argue that we should look at fan fiction as a socio-studies approach to the everyday. While Catherine Driscoll and Melissa Gregg argue that fan fiction is both fundamentally self-reflexive and a group activity that relies on a network of supportive communities, I define fan fiction more broadly to include stories written independent from the larger community. Understand, understanding fan fiction as a socio-studies approach to the everyday as a relevance to both fandom scholars and scholars of everyday life as it represents a new and exciting direction of research for both fields. Previously, fans and scholars perceived fan fiction as an attempt to escape the mundaneness of everyday life. However, I argue that fan fiction can be viewed as an everyday practice for two main reasons. While fans were once viewed as marginal to consumer culture, as a result of the expansion of participatory fan culture, as well as the proliferation of new media technologies, fan practices have been brought into the framework of the everyday. Second, building on Crook's argument that attempts to escape everyday life often become familiar and routine over time, I argue that fan fiction is now an experience of the everyday. In this respect, popular culture becomes the raw materials that fans appropriate, rework, and transform into new stories, a process that facilitates an understanding of their everyday lives. Since representations are not able to fully capture the minute facets, facets and complicated entanglements of everyday life, the process of representation and narrativization is repeated over and over as new stories are written and rewritten in an attempt to capture what happened, how we felt, and what we fear. Thus, like Michelle de Certeau proposes, we still might understand popular culture as a mobile infinite, infinite of tactics, which are employed to make sense of the ambivalence of everyday life. Finally, the key to my analysis lies in my understanding of fan fiction as a direct and indirect representation of everyday life. In the invention of everyday life, Felsky equates the everyday to a blurred speck at the edge of one's vision that disappears when you look directly at it. Taking this into consideration, I argue that by using the familiar characters of popular culture as a tool to talk about the tedium of everyday life, fans indirectly discuss everyday life, and as a consequence, the everyday remains. On many of my PhD applications, I traced my interest in popular culture and cultural studies back to my grade 12 English class. Or in a final paper, I argued for the altruistic nature of time travelers, focusing on the film Donnie Darko and H.G. Wells' novel The Time Machine. Although that paper might have sparked my interest in cultural studies, my attraction to popular culture emerged during the Barney and Friends era. Though discouraged at home, my favorite after-school activity was watching television. Home Improvement was one of my all-time favorite TV shows, which turned into a small obsession. I incessantly videotaped every episode of VHS collection that can still be found catching dust. I wrote songs about Jonathan Taylor Thomas, a young star of the show, to the theme song of another show, Darkwing Duck. And I plastered posters of him in every nook and cranny all around my room. All in all, pretty typical teen girl behavior. In fanfiction online, engagement, critical response, and effective play through writing, Angela Thomas speaks about the identity play involved in fanfiction. Looking back now, I can see how fan fiction offered a space to experience teen romance, explore gender identity, and express teenage emotions. Another one of my favorite television shows was Ghost Rider, which featured a group of mystery-solving teens in New York City who were aided by a mysterious ghost-like creature. My interest in the show took a different turn. I wanted to be part of the Ghost Rider gang. I started writing stories about Ghost Rider and inserted myself into the storyline. I did not write from my own point of view, but from the point of view of an om omniscient narrator, making it feel as though I had always been part of the group. I also started writing stories for school, boring characters from my favorite television shows. One story that stands out fondly in my memory is about two penguins named Will and Jackie, characters from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. While I was always a fan of the show, the playful and kind relationship between these two characters deepened my attachment to the program, and I began to depict and, de and develop the relationship in my stories. My engagement with these television shows can be viewed as a type of effective play. Drawing on Matt Hill's conceptualization, Thomas argues that fan fiction constitutes a third space between the inner self and the outer surface of the primary media text, a space where fan fiction writers experience, live, and feel. At the same time, uh, at the time I was just a kid writing stories about her favorite television characters, yet these were characters that I knew intimately, so using them in my stories made sense. I could express how I felt without talking about myself directly. On the surface, these were poorly written stories about fake characters from television. To me, however, they represented much, much more. 
Although fan fiction may be simultaneously personal and impersonal, direct and indirect, it is vastly different than autoethnography. Here it is important to differentiate between fan fiction as an indirect discussion of every, everyday life and an autoethnographic auto reflection of fan practices, like this presentation. Much of the recent scholarship on fandom employs autoethnography. In fact, it may be argued that the majority of fandom scholarship is autoethnographic. Ever since Henry Jenkins confessed to being a fan in textual cultures, it has become the norm in fandom studies to practice what you preach, or perhaps preach what you practice. In other words, many fandom scholars are also fans. Jenkins discusses how he approaches his research as an ACA fan, who has access to theoretical and empirical bodies of literature and experiential knowledge of the practices and traditions of fan communities. Hills refer refers to autoethnography as a voluntary form of self estrangement in which you constantly question yourself and your experiences. Rather than celebrating this approach, Hills believes it is deficient. Nevertheless, his interest in fandom uh, stems from his own experiences. Conversely, uh, Christina Buse and Karen Hellickson view autoethnography as a cognizance of their subject position, which produces a strong sense of self reflexivity in their work. Throughout their introduction to fan fiction and fan news in the age of the internet, they parallel fandom and academia, suggesting that they both depend on dialogue, community, and intertextuality. In order to clarify the differences between these two approaches, fan fiction and fan autoethnography, I turn to Lucy Sutton's analysis of situated action, developing a deeper understanding of the everyday and the non-everyday. In human machines, reconfigurations, plans, and situated actions, Suchman establishes two uh, contrasting perspectives of action, the planning model and the situated action model. In the planning model, a plan constitutes a series of actions performed to achieve established goals. Here, action is recognized as the expression of underlying plan, and in this respect, our action and the intent behind them are intertwined. Suchman is critical of this view as it systematizes reasoning while ignoring the actual object that is, the very actions that the plans describe. By contrast, the situated action model understands plans as representations of action, which are constructed either prior to or after the fact, in the form of imagined projections and recollected reconstructions. While plans and actions are conflated in the planning model, in the situated action model, plans are distinctly separate from action in that they document our actions. Hence, the intent behind our actions is accounted for in the plans we describe either before or after the act. This description of situated action reflects Felsky's definition of the everyday as a way of experiencing the world rather than a circumscribed set of activities in the world. For her, everydayness is not an intrinsic quality, but a lived process of routinization that all individuals experience. If the everyday is where we experience the situated routines of our everyday lives, for example, the physical action of writing fan fiction, the expression of such routines must thereby belong to the non-everyday, where intentions are assigned to actions. For example, in this presentation, I discuss how as a preteen, writing fan fiction was one way I could express my everyday frustrations. This is not to say that the everyday is non-reflexive. In accordance with Highmore, I contend that giving voice to the complex and often invisible routines of the everyday involves discovering a socio-aesthetic form that allows one to think, think about and contemplate the everyday without talking about it directly. Hence, fan fiction may be one way this is accomplished. While fan fiction is an indirect ex expression of experience, talking directly about the everyday takes us into planning mode, we where we account for and assign significance to our action. This forms the key difference between fan fiction and fan autoethnography. It was only when I started studying fandom, for example, that I realized I spent so much of my childhood writing fan fiction. My experiences, which form the basis of this analysis, originate from the everyday but I can only describe these practices in the non-everyday where I analyze them. It is only now in this autoethnography that I can provide the intent behind my actions as autoethnography becomes a method of documenting and representing <coughs> my actions as a fan. My identity as a fan becomes the reason in the non-everyday for my actions in the everyday. Although most people remain in the everyday until some event serves to render it problematic, for the fan academic, the movement between the everyday and the non-everyday correlates with participating in fan activities and then forming a representation of them to assign meaning. It is this narrativization of experience through scholarly practices that transport ac academics into the non-everyday. Perhaps then we can associate the everyday with participant observation research and the non-everyday with their articulation of that research. But this is not to suggest that only academics can just transcend the everyday 
or that the everyday is something to be transcended, but to demonstrate the difference between fan fiction as an indirect study of everyday life and fan autoethnography as a direct study of everyday life. Thank you. Thank you.